Good morning and welcome everybody to Faith Fellowship Sunday School. I cannot tell you how much fun I'm having right now doing these videos, but I do have to remind you of something that happened last week. Last week in our pre-service videos or emails, Sunday School was not on that and it seems that many of you may have missed week 10. So I'm just going to encourage you right now to go back and listen to week 10 as we move forward today so that you will have a more full, of, full understanding of what I'm going to talk about today. It's very important that you follow the, um, the lessons just to keep getting the understanding that I'm trying to convey to you from the word of the living God. Now, I want to begin with a word of prayer and then we'll open up into, book, into Acts chapter 3. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I just ask you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit's presence, Lord, your anointing, Lord, would be upon your word and upon your servant, that I may go forth, Lord, sharing with your people your truth, that their lives and their walk with you might be enriched by your word, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I cannot emphasize enough to you how important the book of Acts is for any believer. Because as I've said before, the book of Acts lays the foundation for all that we do in Scripture. Your foundation or the foundation of the church is found right here in the book of Acts. So that when you are living your Christian life, it will be based on a foundation and foundational principles that strengthen your walk with the Lord Jesus. Now, we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 3. Let me do a quick review from last week. We talked about the crippled man at the gate, beautiful, the man who was crippled and he was laid at the, uh, at the temple steps every day to beg alms for people going into the temple. And this particular day, Peter and John were going to the temple and the man asked them as they walked by, they asked, he asked them for money and the man uh, or the disciples looked at him and said, look at us, look straight at us so that we can tell you what the word of the Lord is for you today. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. In his name, get up and walk. And the man was immediately healed by God. Now, it's very important that we put miracles into focus or to understand the purpose behind these miracles of course, God wants to heal you and renew your body or your health and whatever affliction you may have, but God has other purposes in that healing as well. It's not just for the crippled person or the person suffering affliction, but there are two other things. First of all, if God just heals you for the purpose of strengthening or restoring your physical body and it does nothing for your soul or salvation doesn't occur, then all you've done has been made whole for this life, but it does nothing for your eternity. But it brings glory to God. When God heals you, you begin to tell people and people that know you recognize what God has done. They remember your affliction and when you give glory to God, then they know that God is in this place. It's very important for us to keep these principles in mind that God heals for more than just your physical healing. God wants to save your soul more than anything because it's not in this life that we have the greatest amount of meaning, but it's in eternity. And there are only two places to go in eternity. One, in glory with God, or two, I just don't even want to mention it right now because you already know the answer. And I don't want to speak a condemnation message today because this is about the early church and all that God did in the very, very beginning. In fact, this is still a part of the greatest story ever told. I hope you're enjoying your Bible because this Bible will strengthen your faith. This Bible, this word of God is going to take you where you want to go in Christ. In fact, if it's not about the Word of God, then it's simply about just books and human knowledge. What you need, what I need, are the very words, theonustos, the God-breathed words that comes from this book, the greatest story ever told. Now, in Acts chapter 3 is where we're going to pick up today, and we're going to start just in memory or just picking up from last week in verse 11. I'm going to pick up there. While the man held on to Peter and John, 
all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Now, I'll stop right there for a moment. Now, he's addressing the Jewish people, fellow Israelites. He's speaking to Israel right now, and these words are very important for them as a nation because God sent his son Jesus first to them. Their response was going to trigger another response, or their lack of a response was going to open a great door. We say that to, their, to our sadness for them, but to our joy because of what their rejection was for Christ, it opened the door for us Gentiles to come into the faith and to know Jesus. So all of the people were astonished at that the man was healed. They're astonished. And they're looking at Peter and John right where God has them. Remember, I told you, the purpose of miracles, one of the purposes of miracles was to bring attention to God or to glorify God. Now, because of the miracle, they have the attention of all the people. And they begin to speak, fellow Israelites, let me tell you what just happened. Now, let's continue reading. He says, when Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. We'll stop right there for a moment. Now, he's saying the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, what he's doing is taking the Israeli people or the Jewish people back to their history the beginning, their forefather, Abraham, the father of all of our faith. They're taking him back. They're making an Old Testament and New Testament connection. Because if they didn't do that, they would have just the Old Testament to focus on. But if without Jesus in the story or their knowledge of Jesus, all they have are the Old Testament books, basically history. But salvation, he's going to say later, is found in no other name except the name of Jesus Christ. So now we have these men, they are, they have the attention of the people and they're sharing the gospel message, the greatest story ever told. Now, another thing I want you to keep in mind is that when you read the Bible, you're getting insight into the mind of God. When we read the scriptures, what we're really doing is seeing God's mind in motion. God is telling us how he thinks. He's telling us there are things that he purposely did and there are things that he allowed. Now, all of it completes his good and perfect will, but the Bible is teaching us that the events of this life, things that take place on this, on this earth, God is fully aware of them all and God allows certain things People wonder sometimes, is, is God causing all of our heartache? No, I don't think God wants to punish you at all, punish me at all. But God does allow events to take place to fulfill his total and complete purpose, his plan for all of his creation. Now, did God just simply desire that his son would die? No, he didn't desire that his son would die, or it wasn't something he just wanted to see take place. He allowed it and he caused it to happen for the purpose of saving our souls. So that is insight into the mind of God, that he's saying, I love you so much. There's nothing I wouldn't do for your salvation, but I cannot sin because I, God, I am holy. I cannot sin. But he allowed his son, or he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So we have... God giving us his son, Jesus. Jesus said, you're not taking my life, but I lay it down for you. I lay it down for you. So in the story, as we continue to read, because it's a fantastic story of all that God had done. It says, you handed him, meaning Jesus, over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate. Now, Pilate was a Gentile. He was the Roman governor. He tried to let Jesus go. But remember, Jesus told Pilate, really, you have no power except the power that my father gave you. So you're not in control of this matter either. 
These things are happening by the, according to the purpose and plan and will of God Almighty. But Pilate tried to hand him over. Remember, his wife told him, have nothing to do with this man. But as Pilate tried to hand him over, the Jews said, no. Anyone who proclaims himself a king is no friend to Caesar. So Pilate relented. He led Jesus. He turned him over to the Jewish people, and they had him crucified. They released a murderer by the name of Barabbas, but Jesus they crucified. Now, as the story goes on, it says, You disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You kill the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. Think about that for a minute. The very author of life, the one whom there is no life apart from him, the one who gave us life, laid down his life. But you know what? The grave could not keep him because he's the author of life. So God surrendered his son or he allowed his son to be crucified on a cross because God knew that he could raise him from the dead. Remember the story of Abraham when he took his son Isaac on the top of Mount Moriah and God told him to sacrifice his son there. Abraham must have thought that if God wants me to sacrifice my son, God could bring him back because he said, we're going to go up to offer sacrifices and then we're coming back. Abraham must have believed that he could raise his son Isaac. God could raise his son Isaac from the dead. Now, eventually, that story was fulfilled in Jesus. God raised his son Jesus from the dead. This is the greatest story ever told. God gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It says, we are witnesses of this. Now he's talking to a people who witnessed everything that had taken place. The Jewish people now are only, let's say, 50 or so days from, or not that much further after, from the crucifixion of Jesus. And he said, we are witnesses of all these things that happened. Some of you standing right here, you saw what happened on that day when this man, Jesus, was handed over to Pilate. And in their minds, they have to be thinking, did we actually hand over to be crucified the Son of God? Did we do that? Is that what we actually did? Their minds are turning. The wheels are turning right now. They realize, some of them, that if this is true, what we did was horrendous. But Peter's going to respond to that in the rest of his message because he's not speaking a message of condemnation, but a message of repentance and turning to Christ, turning away from our sins, turning to Christ for eternal life. This is not a condemnation message. And keep in mind, when you're witnessing to people, you're not speaking a message of condemnation to them. You're not trying to just solely make them feel bad. You do have to remind them that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the message is that there is salvation in no other name except the name of Jesus Christ. Now, as the story goes on, we're going to see more and more how God allowed this whole thing to unfold. So let's continue reading. In verse 16, it says, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now remember, I can't heal anyone, you can't heal anyone. But by faith in the name of Jesus and God responding to our prayers offered in faith, remember James said the prayer of righteous people offered in faith will avail much. As we pray and God hears us and we lay hands upon the sick, God will heal them. So Peter and John wanted to make sure the focus was not on them, but bringing attention and glory to God. Now that John has, Peter has done this, he starts to speak to them. But remember something. I want you to be aware of this. Remember, the Bible teaches we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. It's very important, and it was very important then, just as it is today, 
that the name of Jesus be exalted. There is no name given under heaven by which men might be saved. Or as Paul writes in Philippians 2, he gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, think about that for a minute. In today's world, what people are trying to get us to do is to be religious, but do not deal with or speak the name of Jesus. And that will be a part of a later story that we'll read. But if you take the name out of our faith, you take the name Jesus out of it, all we are is a religious group with no power, with no God, with no hope, and no salvation. Because there is salvation found in no other name except the name of Jesus. So here we are in today's world in a situation where people may not mind you praying out in the public square. You just can't use the name Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute because you'll see this in different venues where they will have religious people praying or even in the halls of Congress or in great events, even sporting events and the events where there are thousands of people watching, they will allow prayer. But notice that many times the prayers will not close with in Jesus name. And so without the name of Jesus, there is no power. Without the name of Jesus, there is no salvation. Without the name of Jesus, all you have is religion or a false religion or a social gathering of people or just an organization that really has only significance in this world or in that system or in that program that they're offering. Without the name of Jesus, all that we do is meaningless. Peter and John made continual references Peter did, to the name of Jesus. That was very important because it's the name of Jesus that's going to make all the difference in the world. So this is why Peter makes sure at every juncture he takes the opportunity to bring up Jesus because without that, it's nothing. Now let's go back to the story. It says, now fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. Now, if we stop right there for a moment, he's telling them that, remember, I said, this is not a condemnation message. He's not trying to just make them go away feeling bad. He's telling them the truth and everything that happened of which many of them were witnesses to. And then it's kind of like tearing them down to build them up. He says, now, I know you acted in ignorance, or God knows you acted in ignorance. You had no idea what you were doing. In fact, Jesus said on the cross, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Peter is reaffirming that they acted in ignorance. They did not know what they were doing. But the story will continue. And the beauty of this story is, is just, it's incredible because this story is unveiling the mind of God. So there's this whole scenario set up. I mean, perfect setup. A man who had been crippled from birth. All of his life, he had lived being crippled. And God takes this man and he has him seated at the very place where the apostles were going to go up to the temple to pray. Remember I, remember I said in week 10 that it was their custom to have their morning, afternoon, and evening prayers. So they were doing, being consistent with their faith, and God had him placed there at just the right time. And as they walked by, the man did what he would do. He asked for money. Now, asking for money probably meant that the man had lost hope of ever being healed. The last place we would ever want to be in life is hopeless where only worldly things will get us through. Living as if there is no God. The last thing you'd ever want to do is live your life as if there is no God. Whatever you're going through, whatever situation you face, whatever it is, you got to remember there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven. There is a God who loves you. There is a God who has all power. He is omnipotent. 
There is a God that is omnipresent. He's everywhere. There is a God, the God in heaven, who's omniscient. He knows everything about you. In fact, he says this, I know what you have need of before you ask. But those very scriptures say this as well. You have not because you ask not. So perhaps there are things in life you're going without right now because you have not asked. Or two, you've given up. And now you've decided you're going to live your life based on whatever worldly things will provide for you. Because God doesn't love you. God can't heal you. God hasn't answered you. Living a hopeless life. This whole Bible is about hope. This whole Bible is about what God wants to do for his people. Not only just in this life, but throughout eternity. God wants you in his presence in glory one day. So these stories are written. These stories are there for us as believers to be able to find hope even in difficult times. Like right now, we're living in a time where there's a lot of despair going on around us. There is despair. There is a sense of hopelessness. There is a wondering in our mind, what's going to happen next? Or is this really the end? As I said in one of my videos recently, people are talking about whether or not this is the, may be the end of the world now more than any time I've ever heard. But even if it was, to us, the believer, it simply means we're going home to be with God. But for the world, it means that eternity begins in eternal separation from God. And whatever the torment is like, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth in this place, I don't even want to think about it. I don't want to have anything to do with it because to me, all I want to focus on is that I'm going to be with the Lord. When I'm absent from this body, I will be present with the Lord. And that same hope that I have, I want to make sure that many, especially my family and everyone that I know or come in contact, contact with, that they know that this is not just a religion. It's a religion when it's just, when it's everything but Jesus. But with Jesus, it's more than religion. It is salvation. It is eternal life through God. Now listen, let's keep reading. Because I could tell you that story all day. It says, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. So remember, none of this caught God off, off guard or out of balance. He had foretold this very thing that Jesus would suffer. If you've read Isaiah 53, you know the whole story of the suffering servant. That servant was Jesus. And it says, by his stripes, we are healed. Jesus took a beating that you might be healed. Don't ever give up on asking God for whatever you need. God does things in his own time. And God always has a bigger purpose in mind than just the moment. Let me tell you one of the reasons why God blesses you. God blesses your life so that you can be a testimony to others. God wants you to create a mathematical uh, error what seems like a mathematical error in worldly thinking. And God wants to show you that that error leads to great blessing. And it's in tithing. For example, if you're going to give away 10% of your earnings, how is it that you're going to end up with more? Well, God says you have to test him in this and see if I, God, will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there is not room enough to receive. See, when you believe in God, you're believing beyond the natural into the supernatural. There is the whole supernatural thing with God. God is not just a man or God is not a man. God is God. God is holy. God is righteous. And he's the judge of all things. So as the story goes on, it says, repent. That's where we go with people. That's where we're trying to get in the message of salvation. Golly, I have to stop right here again for a minute. Listen, I'll, I'll continue to read in just a moment. When we are witnessing, when we're telling this story, now remember, this is not just for knowledge's sake or just to know stuff. Knowledge puffs up, the Bible says. 
But this knowledge is for the sole purpose of using it to accomplish God's purposes. So when we're witnessing to people, here's where we're going. We're trying to bring them to a place here and even to a certain degree in their intellect that you're a sinner. Well, then if I'm a sinner, what do I do? Now, great question. We repent. You do the same thing I did. Brother, sister, friend, uncle, aunt, neighbor. I repented to God. I acknowledge, God, you are right. I'm a sinner. I've been living my life apart from you, Lord. I'm a sinner. And God, you said in your word that anyone who puts their trust in Jesus, in him, they will never be put to shame. So I'm not ashamed to tell, tell you, or I'm not ashamed to confess right now that I'm a sinner. And I won't be made ashamed because in that day I will be in your presence. We're trying to bring people to repentance, not through condemnation, although condemnation is a part of the story. The Bible tells us this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Condemnation is there, but it's removed when we are in Christ. There is now no condemnation. And that's the story you're telling. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And it also says in that same chapter, those who have the spirit of God belong to God. Brother, sister, friend, neighbor, you don't have the spirit of God. You are like a orphan. You have no parent. You have no eternal parent. But then if you want to be part of God's family, just acknowledge his son. Just acknowledge his son, that he is Lord and bow your knee. Because in reality, the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Everybody's going to bow that Jesus is Lord. So in the story, God is telling us all that he was doing or everything that was in the mind of God, everything that was there, God is just unveiling how he thinks and how he maneuvers situations to put everybody and things in the right place for the sole purpose of bringing glory to God. Listen, the next time you pray for healing for yourself or anybody, remember this, tell them, and even say it in your prayer. God healed them because you love them. God healed them because you have all power. You have all authority. And all you have to do is send your word. It will heal our disease. But God also healed them so that the name of Jesus might be exalted. Because that is the name that is above every name. That at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Now let's continue. It says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You know, I'll tell you what, this is gospel 101. And I mean, think about what he just said. Your past can be wiped out. There are people who live life today with no peace, no joy, no satisfaction, no sense of purpose because they cannot get rid of the past and all the things that have been done in the past, the things that have been done to them, the things that have been done by them. God says, I'm going to wipe that slate clean. One of the privileges, one of the great joys I have as a Christian, and I'm talking about me now, and all of us have our own feelings about our faith, but then some of them are just true for all of us is that my past and the things that I've done in the past are no longer, I'm no longer accountable for them. Jesus paid for them. Yeah, you and I, we probably hurt some people and did some things we wish we had not done. But you know what? I'm going to have to let them go that the joy of the Lord might be my strength. I'm just going to have to take delight in what God has done. Listen, God has set you free from your past. Now all that's left is for you to walk in it. God has set you free from your past. Walk in it. Enjoy it. Love it. Appreciate it. Celebrate freedom that is in Christ. Those whom the Son has set free are free indeed. He says, and that he may, in verse 20, that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. 
Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Now, in this story, and there's a great argument that people or that theologians have, and that if they had repented nationally as a people, Israel, maybe Jesus would have returned to the earth that moment. That's a great, great argument. Um, and maybe he would have. Uh, I don't think so. But listen, remember what happened as a result of their failure to repent. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, great chapter for the nation of Israel, is that, um, and Paul tells an incredible story about the future of the nation of Israel. But he also tells in that same chapter what happened as a result of their rejection of their Messiah. Remember, Jesus said, he came to his own in the gospel of John, but his own received him not. And their failure or to receive him or their rejection of him opened the door because he says, from that point on, he says, but to anyone that receives him, he will give the right to become children of God, born of God, not of human descent or the will of a man, but born of God or to be born again. Their rejection led to your and my salvation. In Romans 11, and we'll start in verse 11, it says this, again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? He's talking about Israel. Not at all. God's going to restore his people. It says, rather, because of their transgression, because of what they did, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make, has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious or jealous. See, when they rejected Jesus as their Messiah, the door, the window of salvation was opened to the rest of the world. Now, am I happy that they rejected the Messiah? No. Maybe God had another plan if they had accepted him. Ah, we'll just have to ask God when we get there. But their rejection of the Messiah opened the door for us. And now Paul, in all of his teaching, he's telling us how much he loves his fellow Israelites. And he's trying to provoke them to jealousy because he's now a messenger to the Gentiles. And Paul wants to provoke them to jealousy. But he's saying, he's telling the story. Their rejection meant salvation for us. He says, but if their transgressions means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles in as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Wow, that's incredible. What he's saying is their rejection led to an open door for us, the Gentiles. But their acceptance is going to be far greater. And God is going to restore Israel. And God is going to set up his millennial kingdom. And God is going to save his people. But for a time, they are like blinded or there is a veil over their eyes. And this time has a duration. It has a duration until the fullness of all the Gentiles come in. Let me tell you something. One day there's going to be this last Gentile that comes in and the door is going to close. Every time you lead someone to... Christ, we get closer to that number, to the number of the Gentiles have come in. And so as the world turns, that's an old soap opera my mom used to watch, as the world turns. As the world turns, it's turning in the direction of the Son of God returning. And then the fullness of the time of the Gentile is basically complete and God has saved us. 
this is not going to go on forever in spite of what people say. As Peter talks about, you guys have been talking about the end of the world forever. Ever since the world been, has been in existence, you guys have been talking about an end. But remember this, he says, God is patient with us, not wanting that any man should perish, but that all would come to salvation. So one way of looking at the passing of time is that God's patience is just being demonstrated that people might be saved. Now I'm going to go back to Acts 11 and then we're going to read and we're going to close or Acts chapter 3 and close. It says, for Moses said in verse 22, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be, made, be completely cut off from their people. Now listen, Jesus was not a story or his life was not merely a man being born and then God decided to use this man to do great things. It was foretold. And he told them in a way that we would have hoped that they would have been looking for him. He says he was going to raise up, read Deuteronomy chapter 18, I think 15 through verse, verse 15 through 18 in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And it tells the story that God saying, I'm going to raise up one from among you like your own brothers. Listen to everything he tells you. Hear ye him. It's going to be one of your own brothers. And that story is told in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Now remember, in Deuteronomy 18, they're still wandering in the desert. But I'm going to raise up one from among your brothers. And maybe Jesus in their eyes wasn't the type of Messiah that they wanted. Maybe they wanted one who was just going to come in, annihilate Rome, come in on his trusty steed or stallion, wearing a purple robe and with a sword in his hand and just wielding it and bringing death and destruction to their enemies. And then they would bow their knee to him. Yeah, God's going to have a day of judgment, but it wasn't then. The next time he comes in his fullness, it will be with judgment in his hand. But this appearance or this advent, guys, think about it. This advent was for us. When he came, he came to save us. The Jewish people missed it. They're missing it. Opened a door for us Gentiles to have a time, a season where God would just harvest us as many as who would come whoever whosoever will let them come and that window is still open right now today that window is open that window is open god's arms are still outstretched and he's still saying bring them in he told peter i'm going to make you a fisher of men it's not the fish it's the men that i want you to reel in people unto salvation that's the story remember when you have a Bible study, if it's not talking about the realities of God, the power of God, and what God wants to do in your life, and what God is doing right now in our world, and what God wants to accomplish through you, through me, through us, I don't know what the Bible is about if it's not about that. Saving souls. These stories are the foundation of your faith. This is the early church. This is how it began. And they didn't have eloquence or TV shows or all of these great things. Remember, they were mere men, unschooled men, fishermen and the like, tax collector. But they started this great revolution that led all the way to you 2,000 years ago or 1,987 years ago, something like that. And it has survived throughout time. And it came knocking at your door. And you accepted Jesus. And now this story is supposed to be told by you. Now you are the messenger. We are the messengers of God today in our generation. But you have to know the message. There's so much confusion in the world about this Jesus. You need to know who he is, what he was about, what his mission and purpose was. So that you can explain it, the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that men might receive it and thereby their soul being saved. May God bless you. I love you. This is fun. This is my passion. I enjoy it with you. Please remember to look at video 
10 or week 10 of Sunday school and then continue on with us. We're just going to keep walking. I'm in no big rush. We don't have this something we have to complete by the end of August. We're just reading the Bible. We're studying the Bible, the Word of God together. And I'm hoping that I will ignite something in you to dig deeper for your own personal knowledge, wisdom, and understanding and application to your life. May God richly bless you.